Welcome to another episode of Vihau Inside Business. I'm your host, Nicholas Wittig, and today I'm sitting down with Professor John Hennessy. John served as president of Stanford University from 2000 until 2016. Currently, John is the director of the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program, the largest graduate level scholarship program in the world, and he serves as chairman of the board at Alphabet Inc., Google's parent company. John's experience includes co-founding the revolutionary MIPS Technologies and being founding board chair of Atheros Communications, an early developer of Wi-Fi. Throughout all of this, John remained an academic at heart, joining Stanford as an assistant professor in 1977, working his way up to the Dean of Stanford School of Engineering in 1996, and later as president of Stanford University. John is a leader through and through, and is even referred to as the godfather of Silicon Valley. John, it's an absolute pleasure to be sitting down with you today. Delighted um, to be here, Nicholas. Thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. So today, your extensive career and reputation precedes you. You walk in the room, everyone knows <laughs> Professor John Hennessy. But your journey to get where you are today has had to start somewhere. It had a beginning, too. What was your beginning like in Silicon Valley? Well, I came to Silicon Valley when it was still quite young. There was no company called Apple Computer at that time. It had yet to be founded. Uh, Intel was primarily still a memory manufacturer, just beginning to make its first microprocessors. But we could see that change was coming. The microprocessor revolution was beginning. Homebrew Computer Club was making home, homemade computers uh, where, where uh, Steve and, and, uh, and Wozniak originally got their inspiration. So you could, you could sense something was changing. But of course, since then, it's changed in revolutionary ways. It was still primarily a silicon-focused, chip-focused. Now it's not only that, it's all the way through to large-scale systems to the biggest software or systems in the world. And how did you start MIPS Technologies? What was that process like, and where did the idea come from? So we, we started a project, actually as a brainstorming class, as a graduate class, in about 1980, and we asked the simple question, microprocessors are getting to the point where we can build a real 32-bit microprocessor, something we think of as a computer, not, not a controller, for right. example. Right. And we could sense that, and so we asked ourselves, how should they be designed? What should the instruction set look like? What, how should they be designed? And people were basically, Intel, Zilog, National, others, were copying what had been done in mini computers rather than rethinking the design. So we started a project, Rethink and Design, that discovered what the principles that later became known as reduced instruction set or risk computing, along with the parallel project up at Berkeley that my colleague Dave Patterson was running. We published our papers. We had amazing results. I mean, we were getting uh, four graduate students designed a, a processor that was five times faster than what industry was designing, which was amazing. And we thought people in industry are going to pick up this idea and run with it because it's so obviously great. Mm -hmm. And what happened was they didn't, not only didn't they, but the two companies that had exploratory projects, IBM and Digital Equipment Corporation, then the two largest computer companies in the world, canceled their projects. Mm. So I eventually was persuaded by an early uh, computer pioneer that if we were going to make this technology get out there, we were going to have to go start a company. Mm -hmm. So I got together with a couple other people. One was a former IBM employee that worked on the technology there. The other was a former person from Motorola that had worked on the 68,000. And we put together a business plan, got financing, recruited. What was amazing was we could recruit the very best engineers from Intel, from other companies, because they saw that we were going to offer something that was really different, and it was going to be a very different proposition, new technology, and new approach to designing computers. But I'm sure competition must have been tough here in Silicon Valley, but the talent that you, you had access to must have been great as well. Um, tell us what it was like at Atheros Communications. How was, how was that process? Atheros was a, a sort of very interesting process. My colleague, Theresa Meng, came to me and said, you know, I've been working on this project for DARPA uh, to build a low power GPS for soldiers in the field so that they could have a GPS without having to carry 20 pounds of batteries. And she said, you know, what the key to this technology is building a really low power radio. She says, but I think it has other applications. So we started brainstorming what the other applications would be. And at that time, Wi-Fi was almost non-existent. There had mm. been some early attempts. There was a thing called Home RF that failed. Uh, people were using bipolar, so it was expensive, both in energy 
and in, and in cost. And we just said, you know, could we build this all in CMOS so that you could really empower a mobile future? Um, and that's what we began to focus on. Um, we hired the best. There were not a lot of people in CMOS RF at the time, so we could snatch up some of the very best people in the field um, and get them behind it. And lo and behold, the technology worked. We had one interesting, interesting story. So uh, when the company was about two or three years old, Intel announced that it was going to go into the, in, in, into the Wi-Fi business and that all future Intel laptops would have Wi-Fi built in. Okay. In one way, you think, oh my God, Intel's going to come into this business and here we're this little tiny company, you know, we're going to get squashed, we have 200 employees. But what happened was just the opposite. Intel made it, changed the dialogue so that nobody would build a laptop that didn't have Wi-Fi in it. And because we were far ahead of them in technology, it caused Atheros to just take off, just take off, and the company just went fantastic. So founding here in Silicon Valley, you would say, was an advantage rather than a disadvantage? Oh, certainly. I mean, I think, it, 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 you know, things are, the Valley has changed a lot. It's much more competitive for talent now than it was in the earlier days because it's much larger. Uh, but the availability of talent is still such a crucial aspect to building a great startup that I think it's still a significant advantage. Today, you still serve as chairman of the board at Alphabet. Um, obviously, we just discussed your extensive career, um, but throughout, you've, you've been an academic at heart. Um, what was it that sent you down the path of academia, and specifically at Stanford? Um, what role did Stanford has also play in, in Silicon Valley at that time? Well, I love, being, I, love be, I love being a teacher. I love being a researcher. So for me, I always wanted to be a, a professor. That was my goal when I went to graduate school. And I interviewed only at academic institutions when I graduated because I was really focused on that. Um, and that was really what dragged me back to the university. I could have stayed in the Valley. Mm. Probably financially, it would have been better to stay in the Valley. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not where my heart was, and, and I came back to the university with that, um, that intention. Of course, Stanford has been this um, incubator for so many things in the Valley. Um, you know, not only MIPS, but everything from, uh, from VMware to Tableau to Google to Yahoo to lots of things over in the medical field as well. Um, and that sort of entrepreneurial culture is something that's really deeply embedded, not only in the Valley, but in the university. And so we attract people who think, you know, I want my work to not only be published and, and be read by scientists, but I want my work to really help change the world. Very interesting. So, so pivoting to um, a more educational focus, um, I want to talk about, from your perspective, as, as serve, ser, having served as uh, president of Stanford University, what do you see um, the greatest value is in a post-secondary education? And what should young business students, young university students around the world seek from their university? Well, I think in post-secondary education, you're doing really two things. We, we like to talk about building people who are going to become T-shaped leaders. And in a, a, the T-shaped leader, the, the concept is, you have the vertical bar on the T. That's your depth. That's the field in which you've focused where you've really mastered something and you can, you can engage with people who are leaders in that, in that subdiscipline. But then the T also has that horizontal bar on the top. And those are your, your connections, your connections to people in different fields that allow you to work, if you're a business student, to work with an engineering team and understand what they're talking about, or to work with a legal team, or to work with somebody who's in customer and sales and things. And that, I think, it really educates people uh, to really be effective contributors in the complex world in which we live. And then after university, what advice would you have for young students, recent graduates, young people in the workforce in general on how to find success in today's volatile industry, perhaps speaking to Silicon Valley specifically and then more briefly uh, in the global industry? Well, I'd start by the thing I constantly tell young people is your first job is only your first job. It's <laughs> not the last job you have. It's not the end of your life. It's only your first job. And so particular starting out, what do you want to look for? You want to look for a team you can really learn from and grow with so that you can take the skills you've learned in business school or in another program and really develop those to the next level. 
um, and understand that. Uh, too many young people, uh, lots of young people want to be entrepreneurs. That's fine. But first, first get a little experience under your belt and get some technology to start with. Um, I, I, I'm constantly, students constantly come to me and say, I want to be an entrepreneur. I say, tell me about your technology. Tell me about what you... Well, I don't have any yet, but I want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> I say, well, come back when you have a great technological insight or a great market insight that can really be transformative. So would you say that it's, it's hard to, right out of university, start the next big unicorn? I'd say it's hard because most there's lots of duplicative uh, startups in the valley right now. Lots of startups doing the same thing. I, you know, I, I sometimes tell students, uh, think about photo sharing. There were more than 100 photo sharing companies that got major venture capital investments. I'm not talking about millions of dollars mm. each, more than 100. Which ones do you know? Instagram? Maybe Picasso? <laughs> Maybe Flickr, you know, and that's about the end of it. What happened to the other 97? <laughs> mm. Crash. So I think that having, having a, I sometimes tell students that what you want, you want to have a little, whatever your technical idea is or whatever your new approach is, you want to create a little moat so that you're, you're protected because when you're a small company, it's easy for a big company to come along and crush you. Okay. Now, you've spent time with Mark Zuckerberg. You spent time at the board of Google. You've built multiple companies from the ground up successfully. What advice do you have for young entrepreneurs and leaders um, that will be shaping the future? So I think the most important thing when a, in a, if you're, if you, if you're, whether it's an entrepreneur or you're in another kind of role, is really f first focus. Focus, focus, focus. Uh, try to remember. I, I, I tell people starting companies that the thing to remember is that your first product has got to be successful because otherwise you don't get to build a second product. So focus. <laughs> think about how to make that focus. Think about what your big-term vision is. Where do you want to go long-term? What are you trying to do? So that while you're stuck down in, in the forest looking at the trees trying to figure out how to navigate, you remember what the long-term path you're on and, and try to keep that, uh, keep that in focus. And I think if you do that, stay true to yourself. Um, you know, I've been blessed. I've had a career where I absolutely love what I do. And when I look at people around the world who've been very successful, they love what they do mm. because it's hard to get the energy, enthusiasm, and, and, and preparation and perseverance if you don't love it. If you don't love it, you're going to say, well, what am I doing here, right? Um, and as Steve Jobs said in, the, in his famous Stanford commencement speech, whenever he looked in the mirror for too many days in a row and decided he didn't like what was ahead of him, he said it was time for a change. And I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. So passion, you would say, is the driving force um, behind success. Passion, and of course, it has to go with it has to go with capability, excellence as well. You want to you want to do pick something that you're that you're chasing, that you're both excited and passionate about, but you're also good at mm. um, because you're going to need to be good at it to make it successful. No matter how hard you work, if you're not good at something, it's not gonna it's not gonna succeed. So, John, if I may ask, where does your passion come from? What are the origins, and who are the leaders in your life that you learned from? So my biggest passion, I, I, I love technology. I love seeing new technology develop. But my biggest passion is probably uh, enabling and empowering people. And uh, that's sort of been, if, if, you're a, if you're a professor, that's sort of what you do, whether it's in the classroom or it's working with graduate students, for example, in research settings. It's certainly what you do as a university president. You enable the success of others. Um, and that's what we do in the Knight Hennessy program. We take some extraordinary students from around the world and try to enable them to become the kind of leaders they'd like to be. So I, I look for constant inspiration. Who, what, what kind of leaders do I want to look for? I want leaders that are, that are humble, humble because people who are humble will not be afraid to ask others for help and to realize that it, all big things are accomplished as a team effort, not as a single effort. I want people who understand that uh, the best leaders are servant leaders. They're leaders who serve the institutions, the communities, the groups that they, they are trying to lead. And so I look for those kinds of skills. The leaders of tomorrow, 
what, what do you have to say to them when it comes to topics like diversity, sustainability, and, and our society as a whole? So I think there, there are, we obviously face a lot of challenges around the world, but there are problems we have to solve. We've got to figure, we've got to take a much longer view that I'll survive whatever happens with climate change, mm. but it's gonna change my kids' and my grandkids' life a lot more, and it's gonna change the, the lives of people who are out 100 years from now. And we need to think about that. And I, I think sustainability is the number one global problem. Although there are a few others, pandemics, um, you know, quality of life, uh, that are not that much further on the list. But, but climate change is a crisis uh, coming to us, and we are going to have to solve it globally. It can't be solved by any one uh, country uh, alone. Uh, and I think that, that an appreciation of, of diversity and inclusion is critical to doing that because I need to think not just about my local community. California can afford to live with high cost of, of uh, various mitigations for climate change, but there are lots of parts of the world that can't. Mm. And we need to think about our commitment to all of human society, not just a narrow group of people. Um, and I, I think I, what I'm optimistic about is I think there are a lot of young people who are determined determined to make a difference on these hard problems and are willing to work hard on them. And that gives me optimism about the future. I love that, John. I love that. <laughs> now, finally, a, a Veo Inside Business Classic question. Uh, what book can you recommend to our viewers that resonates or aligns with what the knowledge that you've shared with us today? Well, I think one of the greatest uh, leadership books of all time is uh, Endurance, uh, Shackleton's uh, Voyage, and how he leads uh, a group that are exploring Antarctica through this horrendous situation where basically they probably should have all died. He leads them through this incredible, uh, and builds teamwork. He realizes from the very beginning that he's got to build a team that's unified, that's supportive, that can work together. And he begins skills to build that uh, mindset up in the team. Not only do they survive having their boat crushed in the ice of Antarctica, they survive thousands of miles of journey in open lifeboats to an island and then figuring out how to get uh, people back and save it. And he doesn't lose a single person on the trip. It's wow. one of the great stories of survival, but also leadership and the difference that great leadership can make. Well, John, it looks like my bookshelf just got bigger. I want to thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. To our viewers at home, thank you for listening to this episode of VAO Inside Business, and we will see you next time.